Thank you all for being here. I'm really pleased to have Dr. Stephanie Green join us today. Dr. Green is an early career science fellow at the Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions, where she leads research on the effects of climate change on ocean food webs. She's also a Canadian Institutes of Health Research Banting Fellow. Her research focuses on issues ranging from invasive species and climate change to energy development and science policy. Dr. Green received her PhD from Simon Fraser University and a BS from the University of British Columbia. Yes, she is Canadian. Uh, during her dissertation, she developed trait and size-based foraging models that are used across the Caribbean region to set targets for managing the impacts of invasive Indo-Pacific lionfish on native marine species. In 2013, she was awarded a David H. Smith Conservation Research Fellowship to develop optimal approaches for managing the impacts of invasions within marine protected areas in collaboration with the U.S. National Park Service, NOAA, and Oregon State University. Her work is applied in nature, helping practitioners and policymakers predict and manage future environmental conditions. Dr. Green has served as an affiliate scientist with the Environmental Education Foundation since 2009, where she designs training in marine research and monitoring for international governments and non-governmental organizations. She also develops and leads training in storytelling and science communication. Her research and teaching have taken her to more than 20 countries, bordering the Pacific, Atlantic, and Arctic Ocean, oceans. I'm so pleased that she has managed to make it to our landlocked state to share her knowledge. Welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jen, and thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here speaking with you all this morning. Um, making it up to CSU and, and speaking at the Warner College. The Warner College has been on my radar for a long time as a place where a lot of really amazing things are happening in the realm of conservation and natural resource management, and so it's great to be here with all of you. Um, I want to share with you today, and I'll try and talk equally to both sides of the room, but there's nothing that should need explaining too much in detail on the slides. I'll try and talk to everyone. Um, I want to share with you some thoughts and insights into the role that diversity, diversity among scientists and practitioners can play in the conservation process, and particularly in achieving conservation outcomes that are uh, robust and relevant for the people that are affected by conservation issues. Um, I am based currently at Stanford University uh, here in the US. I'll be moving to a university in Canada. So I also want to talk about what it's like to be a scientist who's coming from institutions in North America and working internationally. What does that mean? What role can I play in that work? Before I start, though, I really need to acknowledge all of the collaborators that have made the science that I've done possible and have been a joy to work with. I feel really privileged to have worked in a number of different places with really inspiring emerging conservation science leaders who are sort of pushing the boundaries of the way that both science and conservation is being done in a lot of different places. So this talk wouldn't happen without any of them. And I want to just um, give you a little bit of a road map. So I first, the first part of the talk, I want to sort of set the stage for what the current state of diversity is in conservation science and practice and what some of the implications for that might be in the ways that we both do conservation and the outcomes that we achieve. Then I want to give you some insights for action and how we might think about moving the needle on um, the ways that diversity is, is weaved throughout our practice and our discipline from research that I've done on marine systems in the Caribbean in collaboration with a number of uh, key individuals and groups there. And then kind of zoom out and think about it, what it means to be a collaborator and an ally uh, for the future of conservation science. How many of you in this room would characterize yourself in some way as a scientist? Okay, fair number of hands. And how many of you have done or do work that is outside of Colorado in your room? Okay, so uh, we have some things in common. This is good. And so what I want to really speak to is um, some of the motivations that I have for getting into this work, uh, why I've chosen to work where I do, and what that means for, uh, 
for collaborating in conservation science. So perhaps like many of you, I became a conservation scientist because I love exploring nature and I love understanding patterns of biodiversity that happen all across our planet and the relationships between species and their environment and species um, and humans. And so um, I also got into this field because as we know across the world, we're seeing immense changes in the patterns of biodiversity across all sorts of environment due in large part to our uses of the environment and the goods and services that we receive from many, many places around the world. And so um, my motivation is to be able to do science that informs some of these drivers of change to both improve the condition of environments but also help to improve outcomes for people. So my lens on this is through marine ecosystems. Um, how many of you work in marine systems in some aspect? Okay, some of you will be familiar with this paper, some of you will not. This is a paper by Ben Halpern and a, a huge compilation of colleagues that just looked at the human footprint on marine ecosystems. So the turquoise blue are regions of the world that have multiple layers of impact or human use that's caused to cause changes in the structure and function of those ecosystems. And a whole suite of studies that have followed up on this um, are showing really clearly that changes in the structure and function of ecosystems also change the availability of goods and services to people that live in those coastal regions. And over the last many decades, recognizing this link between changes in the environment and people has led to the process of conservation problem solving. And I just want to take you through a quick way that I conceptualize the conservation problem solving process. The first of which is you identify the problem. Uh, undesirable change, we can talk about what undesirable means in the environment, and then investigate the drivers of that change. What are causing uh, the factors contributing to the decline or change that you're seeing? Develop a vision of success, so what could the system look like and what are the repercussions of that vision? Identify options for intervention that gets you to that vision. Select among those options and then both implement and evaluate the effectiveness of those conservation interventions. And this could be a cycle that goes around and around. Shades of this have many different names, the adaptive management cycle, et cetera. But a key component of each step in this process is uh, the inputs of data and scientific processes to help inform understandings, both in terms of identifying the problem to identifying what possible suite of interventions could play into addressing that problem. And so over the last several decades, the field of conservation science has blossomed. And it's not just biological science or physical science, but uh, many areas of social science, psychology, public health that are intertwined into both understanding and solving problems. And even within these major disciplines, there's a whole suite of sub-disciplines that play in. It's a really big community of people that are now engaged in conservation science. And so if you look at just the number of publications that have come out in peer-reviewed journals over the last even just 15 <coughs> years, we're seeing this exponential increase in the production of conservation science, science that is purportedly specifically designed to help address conservation problems. One of the things that I find fascinating is thinking about who is doing all of this conservation science. Uh, we have this growing community from a whole bunch of different fields, but who's actually making up uh, the composition of all this work? So this is actually a Google image search for the term conservation scientist. I just took a screenshot of the first 50 results from that page. Um, you may see all kinds of different things within this picture. For me, it makes me think I need to wear khaki in order to be a conservation scientist. Um, but I think one of the key <coughs> things that came to me was, would this image of what a conservation scientist is resonate outside of the institutions where conservation science currently happens? Uh, someone who is a student or a young person in communities across the country or around the world, if they did the same search, would the people that they saw representing this discipline resonate with them in terms of them feeling like they could really become a part of this community? So to think about that in a little bit more of an analytical way, we need to understand who makes up the conservation community itself, and particularly conservation science. So in the last five years, um, a scientist who uh, had similar questions about this um, and a series of reports came out that were authored uh, 
by Dr. Taylor, who really wanted to examine the uh, role that diversity plays or doesn't play in the face of conservation in America. And so she put an incredible amount of energy <coughs> into accessing data on diversity within 191 American conservation and preservation organizations. She also looked at data from federal and state agencies and also in environmental grant making um, institutions. And what she did was by accessing these data, she was able to look at trends in who was being represented in different stages of a conservation career within these organizations. She tried to get data from over 2,000 organizations, but these were the ones where she was able to get good statistical information. And what she found, what to me was, was really startling, but maybe, maybe not surprising in terms of personal experience, is that when you look at how individuals within a conservation organization identify in terms of their gender and also um, in terms of their background, what you find is that as individuals progress within a career stage or you look at different levels within a conservation organization, you see that the representation of people who identify as female goes down dramatically. Uh, in fact, at the earliest stages of conservation careers in terms of internships, and I've experienced this myself, women are actually overrepresented in terms of uh, participating in internships. But when you look at the highest sort of levels within an organization, presidents, board chairs, uh, et cetera, they are underrepresented in terms of their um, proportion in the population. The situation is frankly even more dire when you look at people who identify as being from minority backgrounds. Um, again, the same trend with decreasing representation as you uh, increase with career stage within organizations. So we have a lot of work to do. And I would really encourage you, if you haven't looked at these reports, they are fascinating, they are long, but they have great tables of contents and you can go dig into them and understand a little bit more about her interpretation of some of this. I think you might hear a little bit more about this next week in Megan's talk as well, so just a little teaser for that. But I also wanna speak to another dimension of diversity and that is when we zoom out from just focusing on conservation within America uh, to looking at international, the conservation community in terms of multicultural representation, we also see some trends. So the Society for Conservation Biology is a professional organization that represents conservation scientists and practitioners from 68 different countries around the world. We recently did a, a survey where we looked at the membership of who is involved in the marine section of the Society for Conservation Biology. And we looked at where those individuals who are participating in the society came from. We found a, a pretty stark pattern in that almost three quarters of the members of this international society come from just four countries around the world. So that means just a quarter of people that participate in the Society for Conservation Biology, which is the largest society that represents this particular sector, uh, come from the remaining 64 countries. So together, uh, these data with other data like the Taylor reports, when, they when they're brought together, they show basically that conservation is facing a diversity crisis. So a field that is specifically devoted to conserving biological diversity and the goods and services that we get from it itself is having a diversity crisis. So what I wanna talk about now is just what some of the implications of that low diversity within our discipline might be for our ability to actually do conservation. And my thesis is gonna be that low diversity within <coughs> conservation science actually hinders our ability to achieve conservation success. And I wanna illustrate why I've come to think this and why other authors are, are thinking this as well. And in order to talk about why this might be, I need to talk a little bit about values for biodiversity. So uh, people across the world living in different regions and from different backgrounds hold a range of values for biodiversity and they're context and location specific. They change over time and they can be uh, multiple. But I like to think about values as sort of spanning a range from intrinsic, which means a value that isn't necessarily something that you could monetize and put a dollar figure on. 
things like aesthetics or beauty or the way that um, nature provides services for uh, coastal communities that can't be sort of estimated within dollars are intrinsic values. Extrinsic values are things like income and livelihood generation, uh, which you could actually make sort of an, a financial estimate. That's one way to think about this difference in values. And for the same region and the same issues surrounding biodiversity conservation, you can have values that sort of span that range. So for example, a colleague of mine works very much on oyster restoration uh, in sort of an international context. When she is working, depending on who she's working with, the values that come to the forefront can either be more towards the range of intrinsic in terms of oysters providing habitat and clean water for biodiversity, or extrinsic, where she's talking about the economics and the financial implications of restoration in terms of livelihoods and coastal protection. Another colleague of mine who works in Alaska on salmon conservation in the context of um, preserving populations of large carnivores, depending on the context in which he's working, the values that come to forefront as being most important are healthy salmon populations supporting top predators and trophic diversity, so the systems value, in other contexts, what resonates most is talking about the financial uh, value of the salmon fishery itself and how sustainable that is for providing livelihoods for generations to come. So when we think about diversity within the practice of conservation science itself, I think one of the keys is thinking about how the diversity of practitioners and scientists that we have involved um, influences the values that are brought to the forefront in each stage of the conservation process. And the reason this is important is that time and time again, uh, scholars are identifying aspects of conservation science that really leads to it being effective and relevant. The first is that the science itself needs to be relevant and timely. It has to directly affect decision making or some sort of outcome. The science has to be credible, which means that it's authoritative, believable, and trusted, generated by trusted individuals. And the part that I feel speaks directly to this issue of diversity and representation within conservation is that the science has to be legitimate. It has to be uh, information that's developed by a process that considers the values and perspectives of individuals and groups that are actually affected by the outcomes. And so if you don't have legitimacy, then your conservation science isn't going to be effective. And you're not legitimate if you're not considering the diverse perspectives and values of the people affected. And you might not consider those perspectives and values if you've had no relationship with uh, people of a particular background or context in which those values are important. Okay, I wanna just illustrate one example that I think can kind of um, bring to the forefront this issue of values and conservation and, and their effect on the conservation process. And that is the establishment of marine protected areas. Uh, fully protected marine reserves are essentially parks in the ocean. Areas where uh, human use is completely excluded and enforced with the intention of uh, recovering, preserving the ecological integrity of that environment. There are international targets uh, in place right now where countries are essentially in a race to protect areas of their coastal ocean in order to meet conservation objectives. So the main idea behind this race to implement marine reserves is that they are the main tool that's going to be effective for both protecting and recovering the ecological integrity of our systems. A study that for me really was the first one that opened my eyes or sort of reframed this issue was some work that Tim McClanahan and, and Josh Sinner and others did in Indonesia and Papua New Guinea looking at the efficacy of different marine protection strategies in terms of recovering the biomass of reef fish within those zones. And their study actually paired ecological data on the populations of fish inside these different protection regimes, which were uh, national parks, which are essentially fully protected, co-managed zones, or areas that were under traditional management, where essentially communities that had rights over those coastal territories devised strategies in terms of the timing and the spatial area of closure, and that was negotiated internally within communities. They paired that ecological study with an analysis of the factors that affected uh, the community's participation in these different management strategies to uncover what was driving some of the trends that they saw. 
And so sort of against the conventional wisdom of ecological science at the time that was promoting marine protected areas, they found almost no uh, benefit from these national parks in terms of preserving or enhancing fish biomass compared to adjacent areas. So basically no statistical difference from zero percent change. Areas that were under a co-management strategy between the government and local communities fared a little bit uh, better in some areas and it was context dependent. But what was really surprising to uh, scientists within a large number of conservation organizations um, was that areas that were under traditional management are the areas where the biggest benefits were seen in terms of the recovery of fish biomass. And essentially, what this study opened uh, the gateway to was to rethinking what the goals of marine protection uh, were going to be in terms of representing the values and perspectives of the communities that were directly affected by these interventions. And so what we've seen in the last, I would say, decade is a big shift in the conservation science community from recognizing that simply designing and uh, putting in place interventions that seek to maximize ecological protection alone are not going to cut it. And instead, what we need to be doing is thinking about achieving both ecological and social benefits simultaneously. And so for me, this really highlights that uh, the lens with which scientists are participating in the conservation process, um, that lens can really influence, one, your view of the problem, and two, the suite of interventions that you think might help or be appropriate in that specific context. So what I would propose is that in order to both do conservation science that leads to uh, context relevant and effective solutions and to solve the diversity crisis that we're seeing within our, dis our discipline, we need to essentially redistribute access to participation in conservation science itself. It's no longer, uh, well, and it never has, cut the mustard in terms of having uh, a narrow view of perspectives and values and participation in conservation science. So what does this look like if we actually, if this redistribution could happen? So for me, the vision of success looks like conservation science that's conducted through collaborations between individuals and organizations from diverse cultural, racial, and socioeconomic backgrounds and many other dimensions. And the key piece for me is that leadership in the science is situated in the geographies that are affected by conservation outcomes. Now, this is all fine and well as a vision uh, for success, but this, how as a scientist based in America and Canada, working internationally, can I actually <coughs> contribute to achieving this vision? So I wanna talk about two mechanisms that I think can really be of benefit, and so how some of the work that I've done has tried to utilize these mechanisms to achieve this vision of redistributing access to conservation science participation and leadership. The first of which is co-developing science insights through all stages of conservation problem solving with scientists and practitioners that represent the geographies in which you're working and also the diverse perspectives uh, that exist within those geographies. And I would also argue that co-development is not enough. You, focusing interactions on ones that enhance the capacity and independence of your collaborators is also key to achieving this vision. Okay, so what could this actually look like and, and what are some ways that uh, a conservation scientist who's not situated in the geography in which you're doing work can actually engage? So I wanna bring in some um, insights from research that I participated in working in the realm of aquatic invasive species. Aquatic invasions are one of the top threats to marine biodiversity, particularly uh, right now in the Caribbean region. How many of you have visited the Caribbean even on, okay, good. How many of you have seen a lionfish? Okay, good, this is good. This is what they look like, most of you know that. Uh, Indo-Pacific lionfish are actually native to uh, large swaths of the Indian and Pacific Ocean, and they are a hugely, wildly popular aquarium species that was likely unintentionally introduced into South Florida starting probably in the 1980s, where it was uh, the right environmental conditions to establish a breeding population, start spreading and achieve a, just a vast geographic range in terms of invasion size. 
not only have lionfish achieved a broad geographic distribution, but their populations, if we look at in the water in particular regions, have exploded, increasing exponentially as they gain new territory. And, and this is really what a lot of sites and many of the places I've uh, been fortunate enough to work in the Caribbean have looked like in the last 10 years, with lionfish being sort of the dominant species. What we're finding in terms of the effects of this invasion is that lionfish are causing measurable declines in native species in many parts of the region. They have, I think, over 200 and diff 260 different native species have been recorded in the diets of lionfish. Everywhere we look, there's new species. They have an incredibly broad generalist habit because they're what we call gay plummeted predators. As this invasion was starting to spread, what we saw was that local governments and community groups and NGOs were starting to implement their own version of conservation intervention, typically through manually removing lionfish from their coastal waters. They were literally taking them out uh, by the wheelbarrow full. And so after the invasion had spread, it's now in over 22 different territories and countries in the region, what we decided was essential was to bring together scientists and practitioners who had been experiencing this invasion from all across the region to share lessons and think about the ways that we could work together to identify intervention strategies that actually might be effective, both in terms of sharing lessons regionally, but thinking about the local context of each place that was invaded and what might work best there. Bringing all of these people together was a phenomenal experience, and there were so many insights that came from it. The biggest one, though, uh, that came from it was really just realizing what everyone was up against. This is the potential range of lionfish based on thermal tolerance all the way down to the coast of Brazil. And lionfish were inhabiting habitats that people never thought they would be in. Coastal estuaries with uh, extremely low salinity, mangrove forests, seagrass beds, uh, deep reefs down to several hundred feet. They were everywhere. And so the common thought amongst this group, and everyone really did agree with this, is that complete eradication was very unlikely and, and pretty much off the table. We needed to be doing something else. Think about this problem differently in order to uh, get a handle on it. And so as a group, we started to think differently about this in terms of a switch from complete eradication towards what we call population suppression which is essentially bringing lionfish uh, densities below those that cause impacts to the native ecosystem, effect effectively making them uh, non-functional within that ecosystem. And the goal, the task that everyone had at hand, was how to do this in a way that made the most effective use of resources for control. Now this is a great statement, but implementing this is a kind of a nightmare. So what do we mean by uh, effective use of resources? How, what are the resources that we have at hand and how do they vary across this broad region in terms of the context of the different areas that are invaded? Especially when we think about all the different types of interventions that had been in place and the scale at which they occur. Typically coastline to coastline and island to island with people actually going out into the water and affecting control on an individual basis. Pooling our data from across the region and implementing some ecological modeling did show us that if we controlled lionfish to low densities, native fish would come back. So these green and uh, yellow lines are uh, experimental treatments from a whole range of sites where lionfish have been suppressed and native fishes are coming back to pre-invasion levels. So there was some hope, but the really thorny questions were which areas should be prioritized for intervention and how would local territories harness and sustain effort for removal? This really wasn't a one-size-fits-all uh, issue because the geographies, the environments, the cultures, the resources, and the economies in all of these 22 different territories are extremely different. And so the resources that can be brought to bear, the types of environments that there were for intervention, and the key groups within uh, each society that were going to be most impacted differed greatly. So I want to just talk to you about two collaborative research projects that I was involved in, one in the Bahamas and in one in Belize, where we essentially uh, looked at lionfish as an opportunity, one, to uh, do some research that would really understand the local context of control, but also 
as a way to enhance the capacity and independence of scientists and conservation practitioners in each region so that they could not only address threats like the lionfish invasion, but also the myriad other coastal uh, changes that were happening in their environments. Many of the individuals that we worked with that manage systems across uh, this region wear multiple hats. One day they put on their marine protected area hat, the other day they put on their invasive species hat. Sometimes they're doing permitting for coastal use projects. They're doing it all. So the Bahamas is an archipelago of over 300 different islands. Uh, and it's a territory that actually, even though it has a huge range, has a fairly small resident population, just several hundred thousand people that are not evenly distributed across it. So for example, in the north, uh, Exuma and uh, New Providence Island are the most populous with really dense population centers. And then we have some of the outer uh, lying family islands which sometimes have no residents on them at all. And so the potential for accessing and removing lionfish across this whole archipelago varies greatly, as does uh, what are the economic drivers of activity in each of these island areas. In 2011, uh, I had the privilege of engaging in a project that was funded by the United Nations Environmental Program that was led by individuals from the College of the Bahamas and the Bahamas Department of Marine Resources to bring together uh, conservation and research groups both within the Bahamas and externally to get a handle on what was happening with lionfish across the archipelago. This project um, had a lot of groups behind it, but it also was inspired by um, really tight personal relationships that had developed through other research projects. So this is me as a young graduate student not knowing what I was getting into, and my colleague Nicholas Smith, who's finishing a PhD at Simon Fraser University right now, who at the time was working with the Bahamas Department of Marine Resources. She's Bahamian, and she along with Lakeisha Anderson and Krista Sherman are um, rising stars in marine research in the Bahamas. And so they were the driving force behind this project, identifying key partners to bring in to collaborate with on both on the research and terms and also on the skills and resources that would be needed. The objective of this project were to identify priority habitats across the archipelago for intervention, but also to build this capacity both for monitoring for the lionfish invasion, but many other objectives that were on the table at the time, including marine protected area creation and also fisheries monitoring. We had three field locations and a key aspect to getting this work done across such a huge area was partnering with local institutions that were situated in different parts of the geography and working with them and bringing, sharing resources in order to get the project done, in particular the Cape Luther Institute and then also individuals who live within the Bahamas that work with the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. There are multiple components to this project, including species identification training, field monitoring and methodology. We had three rounds of training that reached over 30 different practitioners and scientists across the, the archipelago. And those practitioners in turn took those uh, resources and then distributed them within their networks. We also had fun doing lionfish capture and handling training and then talking about uh, lab protocols and data archiving, which was a key need for a number of projects within the region at the time. The outcomes of this project five years later are that the uh, archipelago of the Bahamas has identified key spots for intervention, including uh, juvenile fish habitats that provide key nurseries for both um, commercially important and ecologically important species and also a series of protected areas in which intervention for lionfish will complement fisheries management. The part that I really enjoy about this project is that I am no longer involved in it. It is something that is completely independent of me and su is sustained through peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning and knowledge sharing and designing of research. And so methods and protocols that uh, we co-developed are being implemented for things that I, I now have absolutely no hand in, um, which is great and also means less travel to the Bahamas. Um, this project has also resulted in peer review publications that are led by our science team from the Bahamas and there are many more to come. The second example that I'll touch on just briefly is in Belize, which is in the Western Caribbean. It's a coastal state 
uh, in the north part of Central America, which is home to the second largest barrier reef in the world, the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, second only to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And uh, starting in 2015, along with Jen Solomon, who graciously invited me here to give this talk, uh, we engaged with a number of collaborators that are within Belize on developing the Belize National Lionfish Exploitation Strategy. And this really was the vision uh, that developed through a partnership between um, uh, the government of Belize and the conservation organization Blue Ventures, which plays a strong role in coordinating environmental groups across the country and interfacing with the government for conservation. The part that I, uh, I think is so interesting about this project is that it is really taking a systems approach, which I can exemplify by sort of looking at two uh, key groups within the system. One, in terms of inhabitants under the water. So this is the social RAS, which is endemic <coughs> only to Belize. It's found only in that tiny little um, red uh, area, and that's this entire range in the world, the only place that it exists. And it is eaten to a high rate by lionfish because it has all the characteristics that are yummy as lionfish prey. And there is a strong possibility that the lionfish invasion could cause extirpation or even extinction of species like the social wrasse. And on the other hand, throughout this archipelago, you have a long, rich history and culture of fishers that are accessing uh, lobster, conch, and fin fish, and using these same coastal habitats that lionfish have now invaded to make their livelihoods. The government of Belize had just undergone a system of restructuring the way they were allocating spatial fishing rights. And this project really saw an opportunity to try and oops, bring lionfish in the picture as a way to both um, supplement and provide an additional source of revenue for coastal fishers, and also use engagement with coastal fishers as a way to try and control lionfish populations below levels that were going to cause ecological damage to uh, endemic native species in the region. So in addition to uh, driving research questions related to how these social and ecological systems are linked within Belize between fishers, lionfish, and native biodiversity, this project also contained a large component of building capacity and independence for researchers that exist within organizations across the country. So we had the opportunity to, again, gather resource managers and scientists from different areas of government and conservation organizations across the country together for both field and analytical methodology training. And again, those individuals brought those resources back to their own organizations and then shared them outwardly. And then also the opportunity to work very closely with uh, the government to develop a social ecological model of where lionfish fit within to the marine realm in Belize. How could lionfish, fishers, uh, restaurateurs, tourism, and native biodiversity all be linked in a way where we could suffuse interventions into different parts of the system that would meet multiple objectives? And so uh, we spent multiple days a couple of years ago, and Jen was, Jen was a key part of this, uh, in a tiny room thinking about what that system looks like and what a vision of success might look like within this project. So just very briefly, this is a sort of a, a rough illustration of, of parts of that system, which uh, originally started as sticky notes on a large table, where we're looking at quantifying the connections between invasive lionfish, their impacts on native species, and also the opportunity that lionfish can present to engage fishers in control that is meaningful for their livelihoods and financial status. And then thinking about all of the systems that surround that food fish industry and how we can work with them to effectively create a supply chain and a price at which fishers will engage in this cycle. One of the key pieces um, that Jen has been really involved with as well as others from Blue Ventures and the government is the start of a whole new industry involving lionfish. Uh, basically, a, a way to increase the landed value of each lionfish that's brought in by using the fins as a key material for jewelry making. This has absolutely taken off. I know that a lot of the conservation leadership through learning students have, who have been in Belize, how many of you have been in Belize and involved in this project? A couple of you have seen it start from the ground up. 
Um, I hear that there might even be a move for this jewelry to be on Etsy at some point soon. Um, and it's also having all kinds of really interesting benefits for women within coastal communities in terms of building their skill set and independence as entrepreneurs. Okay, so just in closing. For me, what these two experiences have really represented is an opportunity to engage in both of these mechanisms. The first of which is co-developing science throughout the conservation process, all the way from identifying a problem to understanding its drivers, to identifying solutions that might be relevant, to following up and monitoring implementation and doing that cycle again. But it's also, for me, really illustrated the power of focusing on interactions that enhance the capacity and independence of your collaborator network. And so when I think about what scientists who are not situated in the geographies in which they're working can bring to the table, I think about it in a number of different ways. The first of which is you are a collaborator and you, you need to be a collaborator. You can exchange knowledge. Uh, sometimes that might be an outside perspective on external drivers of change or experience in parallel systems. You're sharing resources and introducing new skills. And you're also offering a new perspective and voice that can uh, be brought alongside other scientists that are engaging in that process to validate insights and, and scale them up. But I would argue that being a collaborator is actually not enough. And in order to actually address this gap that we see, this low diversity within our practice and the way that it may be hindering our ability to achieve conservation success, we actually need to be an ally. So what is the difference between an ally and a collaborator? Well, as an ally, you don't just collaborate alongside with researchers, you create opportunities for leadership within, those res within that research. It may mean stepping back and giving the leadership role over to someone else if that's important, if that's the context in which that project uh, should occur. You're also, you can be an advocate for others that you work with in your institutions to become collaborators with underserved groups and organizations. So for example, you are chatting with colleagues in your department or in your lab group who are starting projects in different parts of the world. You can ask them questions about what their plan for collaboration looks like. Who is working in that space in the region that they're going to? What are their ideas for how they might approach the system and understand its complexities and dynamics? And you can also facilitate continued advancement and capacity for individuals and organizations that you have collaborated with. This may look like uh, thinking about resources that exist to bring individuals to your institution so you can share knowledge both ways. It may be extending invitations to give a talk in a symposium or sharing conference travel funds so that you can get collaborators to be in the same place at the same time. Or if you identify a grant to apply for, bring in an individual or group alongside as a, a co-investigator in that grant. I tweaked this figure slightly because it was about knowledge and I, I think it should actually be about co-development. But I think there are things we need to think about in terms of what resources as scientists we need to be able to engage in this process of co-development. The first of which is that it requires dedicated funds that are separate from research funds. Um, and it also requires dedicated time that is separate from research time. And these are significant requirements that require finances to be able to take longer to visit more, to build relationships. It also requires strong communication skills, motivation, and an ability to develop a social network. Um, and then at the institutional level, to help with these things, our institutions can help us by providing training in terms of collaboration and recognizing and rewarding high engagement in co-development and collaboration. And also, uh, when appropriate, bringing in intermediaries or groups to help facilitate that when we feel like we might not have the skill set ourselves. I want to just uh, touch briefly on um, an initiative that started uh, a couple of years ago through the Society for Conservation Biology, the Marine Diversity Network. And this is Pretty much all I'm going to tell you about is the is the title slide because it's one that is still uh, I think being developed but essentially the idea here is to create a peer-to-peer -peer sharing network 
in which individuals from across different geographies, from different backgrounds, can share their skills, their resources, their time with one another in order to build capacity for a conservation science. It's an idea that stems from the marine section of the Society for Conservation Biology, and it's one that really needs support, both from the society, but also its members, in terms of identifying resources to make it happen, and also the platforms in which to facilitate this peer-to-peer -peer learning. And I think this one, oh, where did this go? Okay, sorry, there was a repeat. Um, but I also think that being a collaborator and an ally are two key attributes, but a third one that I think resonates with a lot of people in this room, and it can happen at any career stage, is being a mentor. One of the things that was most striking to me about the Taylor reports was identifying some of the key barriers that were keeping individuals from advancing through conservation science career stages. Some of it starts even at the internship level in terms of being intentional about where you are advertising opportunities, <coughs> be it some, an opportunity to be a research assistant with you in the field, or to be a graduate student, or to be a collaborator on a project. Some of it stems from reaching outside of your own network. So if you're someone who's in the middle of your career and you're creating a panel, perhaps you think about not just who you've worked with in the past and, and who you know, but ask others beyond your network to join in and recognize that that may impact the diversity of people that are represented in your symposium or your event. Recognize that unconscious bias exists. And that is an important and key subject that requires much further investigation than I'm going to be able to talk about, but I think just recognizing that it exists is the very first and basic step in order to addressing it. And I would encourage you to seek out more readings, and I can provide some of those if you want to learn a little bit more about it too. And the last one is garner resources. We are all busy people, and we all have a lot to do. But if we really are going to achieve uh, moving the needle on this issue of both addressing the diversity crisis and also achieving conservation successes that are relevant and robust, then we have to be able to set aside some of our own time and financial resources and energy in order to think intentionally about the problem. And with that, I'd like to thank you and take any questions. <laughs> any thoughts, comments, questions? Thanks so much. It's great to see something from a, a large vision and down to specific case studies, you know, and to see that thought through in that way. Um, my question is, so looking at the adaptive management cycle and then looking at um, how diversity is depicted in terms of the literature, you know, got, me, got me wondering if our problem is potentially larger in terms of how we define conservation science. Yes. So what is science and what is knowledge and what counts? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you can yeah, absolutely. And I didn't, I spoke, I spoke very specifically to um, conceptualizations of science that you have in the published literature, but I think equally important are many different forms of knowledge and, and engaging different knowledge holders. And, and I think, um, again, recognizing that um, analytical science experiments are just one way of understanding the world is the first step, but it's also sort of that broader engagement. And so it's so interesting how much of this comes down to uh, relationships and intentionality and, and listening and asking questions. And those are, I think, process issues that uh, can be modeled and can be demonstrated, but, it's, but it takes time and resources and intentionality. Does that, yeah, it's, yeah, important. Yes. Um. And I'm curious if you can sort of adapt some of your recommendations for creating interactions that increase independence and capacity for graduate students. So what would you suggest a graduate student might do in terms of looking for a mentor, in terms of building skills during their graduate program, in mm -hmm. terms of choosing a project mm -hmm. to kind of work towards a career that embraces some of your recommendations? Right. I think, um, and certainly I've had the privilege of having mentors who have done some of these things in our relationships, is um, identifying mentors who value all kinds of different outcomes in, 
in your graduate experience and, and not just the number of publications that you come out of your dissertation with, but um, allow you the freedom and work with you to, to identify resources to give you the space to um, engage in all the different steps of a conservation process. And, and that might even just be attending, um, sitting in on a meeting where individuals are talking about a conservation issue and identifying the problems and, and as a student being present and engaging and starting to build those relationships. Having mentors that facilitate that for you I think is really key. Um, and also if we're talking about from the perspective of a mentor, um, encouraging students to reach out and build connections outside of just your academic experience. So whether it be through internships or informal participation in um, a side project or um, through taking a little bit of time you know, within that graduate experience to pursue something different. I think those are sort of key aspects for starting and engaging in training. I think at the end I mentioned training for all of those skills that support your engagement with others, facilitation, communication, um, even project design and budgeting are things that I don't think tend to come in the traditional graduate experience, but are so essential for, for doing this work. Yeah, any questions? I didn't have a question so much as a comment and a, and a link with our um, diversity panel yesterday that we just had. Um, I think it was uh, Jose Gonzalez that said the, one of the best measures of success is if you work your, work your way out of your job. <laughs> I think you showed that with, uh, with your first project, and I think that's true. It's, the way of showing success is being able to handle that and to hand that over to local communities and collaborators yes. and let that take, with, take it into Absolutely, and I think definitely that was the experience in our first project. We're still in the thick of the second project, and I would hope that that is where we're going as well. But a, a day in which we, we don't have to in, intentionally uh, tweak the way we're doing this work because it is a, a system that for the large part is achieving what we want and is creating that vision I think is, yeah, key. Thank you again for sharing with us today. Um, my question goes back to the prioritization system early on in the Caribbean islands. Yes. And just wondering what was that process like and who was involved in that process and which value systems to make a prioritized list? Yeah, so um, the first part was more about like the regional coordination, but do you mean within the Bahamas sort of location specific prioritization? Yeah, so that is, um, that is a process that was done with representation from a number of different groups nationally. And, and actually in terms of providing input to that, um, I was actually not completely involved in other than sort of helping to facilitate and provide information and, and sort of feedback on that piece, which was actually really neat to see. And so the prioritization for that was coming from the lens of what some of the key other conservation objectives that were identified for the archipelago were, both in terms of um, fisheries resource preservation and the creation of networks of protected areas there. So how could this intervention strategy help to achieve some of those other multiple objectives? And again, it's so different depending on which islands you're talking about in terms of access and, and resource. But yeah, I'd be happy to talk more about that after. Yes. In speaking about sharing knowledge and exchanging information, even as a student, lots of times when I'm doing research and searching for papers, I can't access it unless I pay for it. So how do you see that actually, that exchange being facilitated in the practice? Yeah. Um, oh, I could go on about the scientific publication paywall and the big challenges that that creates for so many people. I think, um, personally, my strategy has been to share my access information with collaborators to facilitate the ability to access all of those resources and anytime that someone I've worked with or an organization I've worked with emails me for a resource I'll just uh, prioritize that and send it. It is a huge challenge and I think some of that is again the way those systems are publishing are set up and Jen and I were talking about this initially there are other ways to share that information 
and, and get around that sort of publishing machine in terms of writing. A number of uh, outputs from these projects have been white papers that are posted as PDFs on, online or printed hard copies that are distributed that contain the same content as our scientific publications, but are just going to be disseminated and archived in a different way. And, and those might be archived within one um, local organization who then keeps a repository of both hard and electronic copies on the web. And so that, that's one strategy I've seen work in terms of, of accessing knowledge and keeping it accessible. Um, kind of to piggyback off of Bagley's question, in terms of sharing knowledge, is there any type of inter-country like, partnership going on? Like if something's working in the Bahamas, are they going to Belize for either digital or in-person workshop trainings and kind of sharing strategies? Or, and or is there like a larger Caribbean network management plan that's being implemented like across the like, you know, like, uniformly across all countries? There, there isn't really a plan that's being implemented across all countries, but there are aspects that, of coordination that are happening. So there is a regional working group, which is funded through a couple of different sources, and there are also some existing um, structures for sharing information within the region, the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute, um, the Caribbean Association of Marine Protected Areas, listservs and other groups that will gather people together to share lessons around this. And um, I believe there have been, at least there was through this uh, Bahamas project, it was a larger project that involved multiple regions where there was um, exchange essentially between scientists and practitioners between different regions to share outcomes. But I think it's something that more of would be great. And um, I think individuals can put aside some of their resources to help with that, but, but pooling those resources will get more from it. Um, and so I think there's, yeah, there's always more that could be done on that front. Any question around communicating um, to colleagues or people.com or, um, organizations that maybe I would start a collaboration relationship with about the need to prioritize diversity and why as conservationists we should. I've had a lot of people, I've interacted with many people over the years who say, well, that's not, that has nothing to do with me. I don't see how that relates to me. I don't see how that relates to my work. Um, the challenges you faced in that and ways to present that and then things like that is, um, that's a great question, and it's um, one with so many dimensions that um, let me think about where to start with it. Steph, would you mind just summarizing so, and repeating the question? Yeah, so the question was, how might you convey the importance of diversity to your work and, and some of the challenges, well, the major challenges that we're facing and, at multiple levels? Is that a fair summary of yeah, the question? Yeah. To colleagues and who so feel it's not relevant. Yes. Um, I would say that, um, again, it's one of those things where actions speak louder than words, and a, an illustrative story or engaging in a project that, that um, does address issues of diversity and the benefits of the perspectives and values that come from that has, for me, I, I feel like engaging in this work and being able to bring back um, to share how some of the successes have manifested because of the importance of the diversity of people that I've engaged with. Yeah, so um, thanks for that question. So the question was about lionfish and the invasions effects with creating marine protected areas. And actually it's been a challenge. Uh, one of the things that came up with some of these regional um, meetings and interfacings that we've had have been the regulatory challenges around uh, implementing a marine protected area and on the one hand really wanting to be able to extract this one specific species and a lot of that has come down to very context specific issues of relationships and trust between different groups within uh, the region that's dealing with it so for example um, the Cayman Islands has taken one approach to it where they've gone to licensing particular people to go out and uh, spear lionfish and they have to have certain protocols and training. Um, Belize is looking at uh, can they engage different uh, community groups in uh, 
harvesting lionfish in protected areas, perhaps that's one way to achieve some positive outcomes for the dive industry, for example, or through lionfish derbies, and then uh, leave full open access to fishers in other areas and, and engage them in extracting lionfish there, so sort of a spatial management approach. Um, and in the Florida Keys, um, it's been really interesting to see some of the relationships that have de developed between commercial and recreational spear fishers and conservation organizations who typically don't have a lot to do with one another. But lionfish is an issue that they can actually work fairly easily together on in terms of coming up with strategies to access fish in protected areas. And from my sort of very uh, preliminary perspective on that, I think it's actually the issues helped to develop relationships and trust in an area where there wasn't much before. It's kind of been an interesting sort of side effect. But yeah, it's a very, yeah, a key issue.